we just received. Bev, let me know that you guys are having beautiful weather out there. And uh, when we get to come see you on the 25th, we'll be bringing our flip-flops and bathing suits. So, so excited. Um, so excited to get started today in our deep dive into action expression. There may have been a little communication error in, um, in the email. So if you are expecting representation, remember you can access that on the Padlet. All the resources and uh, information are there from uh, the last webinar. But we are jumping into our last guideline today in the UDL guidelines, UDL um, action expression. So uh, one of our favorites uh, to talk about, and Alsa, can you tell us what uh, so these images that you've picked and why? Yeah, these are two images. I have an art background, so where I can, I like to um, make connections to art and you know science. But uh, so the first is um, a typewriter, and there was a gentleman named Paul Smith who had cerebral palsy, and he wanted to be an artist. And due to his motor uh, limitations, he was told by his teachers he couldn't be an artist. But um, he discovered the typewriter, and he was able to type um, unbelievable artwork. And um, and I invite you to I'll, I'll type his name in here, um, Paul Smith. Uh, he recently has passed away, but he made made amazing artwork um, with a typewriter and talked about how exciting it was when colored ribbons came out and he was able to add color to his, his images but it really it was very remarkable so I think it's I like to start with it for action and expression because uh, we don't need the latest and greatest in technologies um, but what we do need is just an open mind to think about how we might be able to access tool or you know, leverage tools uh, to be able to achieve the goals that we want and I also have a picture here from Picasso um, because I also like to talk about, and I'll talk about this a little more um, midway through, um, but Picasso, you know, really innovated artwork, uh, pushed it to new levels, but he didn't always paint that way. In fact, he used to copy every single master when he was younger and learning to paint. He would copy the masters. He would you know, copy Renoir, um, Toulouse-Lautrec, and, um, and eventually he made it his own. And when I think about UDL action and expression, so often as educators, um, we don't like to show the answer. We don't like students to copy our work. But what we can what we can know from our own experience, the way our own learning brain works, is that copying is often what we need to do first. You know, the first time we get a recipe, I like to copy it exactly. Um, you know, the first time I'm show, shown how to do a math problem, I want to copy exactly what the teacher does, and then eventually we make it our own. And so I like to just kick off with these two examples um, because I think um, they can really um, push us to think differently about um, how we use models, how we use tools for action and expression. Awesome. We see some a few raised hands there. Uh, the link to the slides is active in the chat box. So if you want to open up your chat box, you can get the link to the slides there and it will be active on the Padlet shortly after um, our work today. Thank you. Uh, so let's continue just centering ourselves around our trajectory and where we're going. Um, our first few days, we talked about um, intro to UDL. We went through goals. We outlined our probabilities and talked about that iterative design in UDL and how it's so important to really uh, apply UDL to a need for change. We, we went through the engagement guidelines, representation guidelines, aligning our knowledge and practices to those strategies and to those guidelines. And now we're finishing, finishing up with action expression. And that will, this whole picture right here gives us a clear view of what we call the UDL framework. The UDL guidelines of engagement, representation, and action and expression are a tool. They're, they're something that helps us to proactively design in our environments. It's something that help, can help us problem solve when we're looking at our opportunities. But understanding all of these pieces together makes the UDL framework. Without goals, without a need for change, then we're just kind of um, implementing options without a purpose. And so this, this whole image here is about the UDL framework. Uh, today's goals, we're going to continue to align our knowledge and practice with the action expression principles uh, that'll finish off our common language and help us to really go forward with just continuing to implement and seeing how does this look in our context. And then we'll apply to that opportunity. And so, I, this representation of um, 
you know, of this UDL framework hopefully aligns with what you've been reading in the UDL theory and practice book. It outlines it differently. It um, is, we approach it as you've probably found much more from your classroom or context, wherever that is, um, and the goals. But we hope that you find that this is just a different representation of the information that's also available in the book that you've been, um, that you've been reading. With some flexibility in our in our next webinar on March 16th, we'll do some more uh, discussion around the book and some feedback and some um, you know call outs. So please uh, you know feel free to finish up that work. So a quick re review that UDL lens: we all have strengths and skills. We all can look at the learning environment and think. How can I most effectively communicate my understanding? And that's what action and expression is all about. How can I communicate that understanding in a way that's comfortable for me and allows me to apply to situations that are uncomfortable or maybe new. So before we get into some details about that, we wanted to tell you our UDL plus ones mm -hmm. since the last time we've seen you. Um, someone asked for the resource, all the resources that are in the slides. Can we have that in uh, a more accessible format? So you'll see the, uh, the purple brain there for representation. There is a resource list that's now linked in the slides and on the Padlet. So I'll put the link also in the chat box yeah. here. So you'll see this document here. My next step is to go through with a link shortener and shorten some of these links for you, but it is an accessible document that you can download as a PDF and use it with, uh, within your context and your people. So that is linked um, on the Padlet right in the, uh, excuse me, webinar links materials right here. You can get to that. The second thing we've done is uh, we've added a learning series checklist. So because we're in act and expression and we wanna support your executive functioning, if you kind of need that big picture again of what are the things that we've been doing? How do I know that I can check all the boxes? You can literally check all the boxes here. This <laughs> an overview of when the face-to-face -face sessions were, um, the book study document, our webinar, the webinars, um, and the schedule there. So if you haven't been able to catch a recording, you can go on and do that. And then what we're doing for implementation in preparation for the March 25th pre-conference. So this is to support your executive functioning and to help you, um, you know, just center itself, yourself around the work. So please feel free to download that. Um, you do see at the bottom that there's room for name and signatures. We're gonna ask that at the end of all the sessions that you submit this. Um, we're working on a way either to email Bev or you can upload it to a Google Drive um, that will be linked on the Padlet. Are there questions with that, thoughts? Yeah. of these things, yeah. The webinar resource list or the learning series checklist. It is remarkable to see it add up over time. All right, seeing no action. Um, the last thing, and so you'll see that that was supporting uh, action expression. The last thing, consider a video conference between now and um, our March 25th pre-conference. We were, Allison and I were able to do this with one of, absolutely Wendy, um, Allison and I were able to do this with one of the participants and it, it was so beneficial, I think, for both of us. I think Allison and I got more out of, out of the <laughs> conversation. But it was just a way to connect. And all we did was set up a Zoom conference just like this. And we talked about what was in the, the um, focus area document. What are the things you're working on? What are the questions you're having that you're considering? So if you feel like that is beneficial to you, email Allison or I um, or both. And we will um, definitely connect with you and um, make sure that we can help to support you and answer your questions. Um, and we learn so much and we are able to tailor these sessions um, based upon that feedback. So please consider um, emailing and we'll set up, set up a little video conference um, with you and your team, especially if, if you're one or you're a whole team that is looking for some information, we'll do that. And we'll make sure to fix that resource link. I'm not sure why that's not. Yeah, I'm not. I just tested it and it worked for me. So, Megan, maybe we can, um, you know, chat afterwards if it's still not working for you. Um, we'll make sure to so, yeah, it yeah, I just tested it and it seemed to open. Great. Awesome. So, when I'm thinking about action expression, there's two questions I, I like to. So, have your chat window open so that you can respond. There's two questions I like to think about um, that help me to center around this work. Um, and think about this principle. 
So and if sometimes, can I pause you before you start? Sometimes when we're doing this in live trainings, um, we'll use something like Poll Everywhere or Plickers or something like that to be able to get a quick um, formative feedback from the audience. So clearly when we're in a webinar, it's not as effective to you know, do a Poll Everywhere or Plickers. So it's just gonna be typing an A, B, C, D, or E um, into the chat box. But we hope that you think about using um, Plickers, which are just free, they're basically um, like little QR codes that each student has um, and they, you just print them out and they're able to hold up A, B, C, or D and you just need one device um, in the room so you as the educator could do a quick scan of everyone's answer and you're able to get really quick formative feedback um, in the middle of a class, for example. Um, and it's similar to using Poll Everywhere, which again, you um, all your learners need to have a device with poll everywhere so they can just take quick polls. Um, or you can do what we're doing, just do an old fashioned A, B, C, D, or E, but wanted to highlight a couple tools related to action and expression here. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so if you had to d demonstrate your knowledge of UDL, would you rather A, present information using a PowerPoint, write an essay, C, teach a lesson while being observed, take a test, D, or E, other? So please respond in the chat. Um, what, and if you respond E other, what would, what, how would you do that? What would be your way? As we see them rolling in, taking a test. Wow. It's very popular, uh, among participants, but we start now we're starting to see some variability A and D yes, multiple. Um, multiple assessments. I think that would give a real accurate way. And one of the key things that we want to highlight here, because often we'll hear from educators, I don't know how I would assess if someone's presenting with a PowerPoint or someone's writing an essay or someone's teaching or someone's taking a test. That's too many things to have to assess. But actually, what UDL encourages us to do is to know exactly what the knowledge of UDL is. What is the construct that we're looking for? Then we can look for it in the PowerPoint, in the essay, as they're teaching, and in the test. It's consistent, and so it's actually easier to assess because we know exactly what we're looking for, and the learners know exactly what they're looking for. And then it gets really fun to see all the different ways that it comes to life, and you're able to better transfer understanding of that information. That's powerful, deep-level, rigorous learning. So it's really, you know, I think a, a very nice way of subtly understanding the power of um, options for action and expression. So if any of uh, the, P the participants that chose A or D or E develop a process or product using UDL, um, if you had to do it in one of these other ways, it would really feel unnatural. And a lot of times we do have to get to that. We do have to get to that standardized test. We do have to get to this one way, but first understanding and demonstrating our knowledge in, in a way that's comfortable for us can help us to apply it in those unfamiliar situations. Yeah, because if you don't know the content and then you also have to present, you have two pieces that you're really having to do. One is on the content and one is your ability to present. And that presenting could actually take your cognition offline so you're not able to demonstrate what you know as well. Um, so it's definitely interesting to think about how the, how the construct um, is um, what you really want to focus in on and not necessarily get rid of that superfluous other stuff that isn't quite as important um, for that moment. Excellent. So that first thing is this first question leads us to how we want to present or how we want to show and share. And if I go to the next question, uh, you have to present data to show growth to your supervisor. Would you rather A, design your timeline and product for approval, B, be given a timeline and specific products, C, collaborate with your supervisor to design a timeline and products, or D, do you have an other? So feel free to go ahead and respond. We're seeing some C's and some A's, a lot of C's, a lot of collaboration. Access. Oh, yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. And we do see some V's in there. Yeah, great. So what, what we're asking here this, with this question is now, how much scaffolding and support do you want in the process? In the process of showing and demonstrating your information, it can be really overwhelming if someone says, hey, I wanna design my own timeline, but there's people who wanna do that. Like, I, 
have been doing amazing things in my classroom with my students, and I want to demonstrate that. It may not look like it on this assessment or this test, but if we look at the, the range of skills that they've developed, I can really show you that. And other people feel really comfortable by be give, being given that timeline. One of, the, one of the misconceptions about UDL is, oh, just offer choice and let everybody do things the way they want. Well, that can be really ineffective and create a lot of barriers as well. So it's this balance. It's this balance of allowing uh, people who, who in one context or one class may be able to do things on their own and really kind of be independent in that situation as long as you're supporting that process, um, allowing them to develop timelines in their own products and giving feedback on that, engaging in those discussions. But also, if someone needs that structure of what are the, what are the broken down timelines and products that I need to produce, that can be really, really successful as well. Allison, anything to add on that? No, I think that that um, that's good. Yeah. So those those two questions really help me align to the the action expression guidelines. Is how do we want to show it, and how scaffold and supported does the does the process need to be? Excellent. And everyone's going to be variable in those different contexts and different situations. So that I mean, really, up. actually, there is something I want to add. Yeah. So when I think of action and expression, I think I, I think often about cognitive load in the brain. And I really think about how much our brain can hold at a given time. I mean, there's only so much we can hold. And when we have uh, background in something, those networks fire more readily. They're practiced. They, you know, the, the neurons that fire together wire together and they're able to be very efficient. So you actually use less energy when you're practiced, when you have expertise. When you're first learning a skill and you're having to neurologically build and form those connections, that takes a lot of energy and your brain literally tires faster. So if we're asking students to learn new information and learn new skills and, you know, there you can literally i try to imagine you know your cognitive load increasing um i mean a classic for me was my first year teaching uh i felt like i was juggling so much in my head and i remember getting home one afternoon and my husband said you know can you go grab some milk from the store and i was like no <laughs> i don't think i can i don't think i have any cognitive space left for that um so often when i think of action and expression i really do try to ground in thinking about um goals and cognitive load Excellent, thank you. So the strategic network um, is the center of the brain that we call that the CEO of the brain that supports executive functioning. Um, if you've done some research on executive functioning or you have a real clear definition of what that is, that can really help to plan and support in the learning environment. Um, we have some resources to go to that are some introductory information on executive functioning if you haven't um, been into that. So it, the strategic expertise includes setting goals, effectively monitoring progress, and adjusting approaches as needed. Um, and this is a space that uh, in education, sometimes we, we often miss. We often, we, we have the assignment, we give the assignment, and we, we, we require all of the students to be able to do these things, but we don't scaffold and support that process. And that can be something that's completely missed. So looking at ways to do that um, really supports the learners, especially um, in higher education where you're having, there are so many long-term projects and um, you know, different classes and different things can get in the way of that executive functioning for, uh, for all of those learners. And of course, we know that even though that we, uh, you know, in UDL, the picture of the strategic networks looks blue and in the front of the brain, <laughs> of course, we know that there's variability and we know now, and so we put the picture in that, that top right hand corner, again, reminding us of the connectome. We know neurologically our brains are heavily, you know, they're, they're very interconnected. So this executive function center is not working independent of your emotion centers, your perception network. So again, I just like to ground in um, the interconnectivity that we have going on so that we don't lose, um, you know, that background that we've built in terms of engagement and representation, all intermingling um, with action and expression. Uh, the other thing that I I think is super interesting and that's one of the, the little graphs down here uh, again a lot of you may be familiar with this but um, the frontal lobe is actually the last part of the brain to go to undergo big changes and those changes typically start happening in the teenage years again there's variability for some some individuals by 16 their frontal lobe is fully formed and for some I like to kind of, you know kind of pick on my 33 year old younger brother who's you know sometimes we're like I don't know about that <laughs> that frontal lobe if it's fully developed or not but 
that, you know, there's variability in its development. And so what we find as educators that we're often doing is we're often acting as that frontal lobe. We're often, you know, helping to, you know, help learners to be goal directed, to learn how to progress monitor, to achieve those goals. Uh, and I do find that it's interesting. I like this, um, this picture of the brain that has the motor cortex outline. This motor cortex um, is really aligned with different movement centers in the brain. So um, a lot of studies, for example, have been done on musicians who, um, let's say a violinist, is using their fingers a lot. That motor movement, that muscle memory literally is aligning to that motor cortex strip. And the more you use it, the more that real estate in the brain literally grows. So I think that again is a really exciting thing to just remind us that our brains are plastic. They are going to build and develop and scaffold throughout our lives based on what we're doing. So what we're really hoping that we're um, supporting learners to do are to build those structural networks that really help them to be very goal directed um, and to know how to progress monitor along the way. And of course, I'll just again say, and we know that engagement plays a really key factor in that um, and aligning all of that. Did you want to add? Yeah, I was just going to say stop and think on that for a moment and maybe just offer up some barriers. What are some barriers that are getting in the way uh, for your students, your learners, and, and, and your staffs in that environment um, for them being goal directed, for them being strategic, um, for them setting a goal, creating a plan, um, and, and exacting that plan? So um, what are the, some of the types of barriers that you're, you're experiencing um, with those learners? Oh, I like that, role models. That's such a powerful one, Susie, thank you. Yep. Even just subtle posters that are in the room or in the, you know, the commons area, um, seeing those images is, uh, is, yeah, very powerful. Lack of previous success, yes. And definitely by the time you get your learners, They've had a dozen years of feeling success or not feeling su success. Too many things going on in their lives. Yeah, you have folks who have jobs. You have folks who have kiddos. Yeah, that cognitive load piece comes in there. Mm -hmm. Preconceived acceptance that they can't achieve the goals. It is amazing what our own brain tells us we can and cannot do. Yeah habits carried over, right? There isn't a norm, we, we know there is no such thing as a normal. I mean, that's what's been so amazing about the brain research. So whenever there's an average anything, that average matches no one. It really is very amazing. The effects of poverty, you know, the effects of poverty begin in utero. And uh, so, to think that, that we all don't start off in the same place, for sure. There's some great, there's a great book called um, From Neurons to Neighborhoods. I'll type the title in here. Um, that talks about some of the neural, um, neural impacts of, um, of poverty. Excellent, thank you. So with these, with these barriers in mind, that's how we go ahead and proactively design in the environment. So uh, we'll get into some strategies. So we're, we, we've taken this, um, this trip down, centering you around two questions. How can we show our understanding how scaffolded and supported does it need to be? Um, and then we looked at some, uh, some brain science and know how that executive functioning needs to be supported because it's so variable in how it develops. So what can we do about it, Allison? Oh, there are some fun things. This is the fun time. And again, know that there is no one tool or no one way. So really here, we hope that this is where you begin to design your options for physical action um, that are connected to your learning goals and are appropriate for your context. So some of my favorites um, have been to open up opportunities where I can, where it's appropriate to write, draw, construct, or build. One of my favorite um, examples of how um, options for physical action does not reduce rigor is called Dance Your PhD. I don't know if any of you have seen Dance Your PhD, but they take PhD papers, which are often quite challenging to read, and they represent the information through a dance. 
And uh, there was a physics um, example of how different photons were moving through different substances. And even as you know, a science major, I was hoping that I'd be able to access and read that paper. I usually really like that stuff and I was having a hard time and I watched the dance <laughs> of that PhD dissertation and it was unbelievable. It gave me a visual representation that made me return to the text and better understand what was going on. So again, we wanna make sure that these options for physical action are in service of, of rigorous, challenging learning. Um, we Another example that I like to talk about is called Today's Meet. Um, so David Rose, who is the co founder of CAST and Universal Design for Learning. He taught a course at Harvard and one of the things uh, in Universal Design for Learning, and one of the things he valued in his course was class participation. But he recognized raising your hand and verbally speaking is only one means of physical action. So he started having a back channel. Um, and an example of a free back channel resource is called Today's Meet, where um, people can have, very much like we do with the Zoom chat window, people can have participation non-verbally. So if the goal is around participation, recognizing that Verbal uh, is only one way, and there are a lot of barriers for some individuals to verbally participate in class. So again, if the goal is about getting everyone to verbally participate, that's good to know, then scaffold that. But if the goal is just around participation, you might open it up to some different, um, to some different options. Twitter is one that we use a lot in the UDL world. Um, if you hashtag UDL or has, hashtag CASPL, there is a whole universe of UDL folks out there. So um, just for your own options for physical action, if you're wanting to network a little more and chat with a larger, it's actually international, it's mainly national, but there are some international contributors um, in the UDL world. You can actually, um, the first and third Wednesday of every month, there is a hashtag UDL chat, 9 p.m. Um, Eastern Standard Time, if you go on Twitter, there are folks talking about UDL. It's really, it's a very, sometimes some very deep questions. Um, oh good, thank you, Neil. And then the last um, example that I put on there um, is what we were talking about earlier, the plickers. So you can feel free to access those plickers. And of course, this is the UDL checkpoint that really does address assistive technologies. So keyboard options, switches, um, really thinking about physical accessibility, not just for learners. For example, we, I talked about cerebral palsy at the beginning with Paul Smith. Um, Locked-in syndrome um, was, um, was what one of the first uh, clients of CAST had locked-in syndrome where he couldn't move anything except his jaw. And they were able to hook him up to a switch and they were able to find out that there was a lot going on in his head. Um, his barrier was in the physical movement of his muscles. So again, we're thinking about how can we make, how can we remove those barriers so that what is in our heads can be communicated clearly. And we open those up, up open those options up for all. Other thoughts or questions there or ideas that this is sparking from you all? So what else do you do uh, in your environments so that uh, students can participate even non-verbally? Things like chalk talks, which I know that we've done um, at, at our sessions, our face-to-face -face sessions. Um, paper passes or folder passes where there's just an, uh, a probing question and we can circulate those and have a silent conversation. What else do you do uh, to allow students to respond in various ways? Walk around charts, cool. Digital projects, yeah, excellent. Yeah, by the time you get the, the kiddos, they're young adults and have more experience with a lot of digital technologies, more and more, I'm sure. Ooh, menti.com, I'll have to check that out. Artwork. Yes, one of my favorite examples was a student who did an abstract art um, painting of different phases of cell division. And um, it looked like a mess, but when you looked at the way she labeled and how thoughtful she was and deliberate in how she represented her understanding of um, cell division, it was really phenomenal. It was much, much richer than a multiple choice assessment. 
That's true. So ELA classes, by definition, do rely heavily on visuals. Yep, collages, images to support what students will say, storyboards. So that's the exact, you know, instead of just thinking about certain learners, let's open those options up, have them goal-driven for everyone. Oh, Kahoot is a fun one. Yep, yep. Great. Fun, yeah, this is where the fun comes. <laughs> I love to see this, um, the rigor around these guidelines aligning because physical action, we're, obvi we're obviously thinking or often thinking, um, getting people moving around the room. And that's not the goal of this, the goal of this, because some, some, that might be a barrier to some. So the goal is to just offer those different ways to participate um, that are nonverbal um, so that we can have everybody's understanding going back to what we're here. Action expression is about uh, sharing understanding. So great, thank you. And again, just keep it goal driven so you are getting at rigorous content. You're not necessarily assessing the artwork, you're assessing the content that's being represented by that artwork, unless the artwork is the goal. <laughs> So the middle level of the UDL guidelines um, is actually something I think educators tend to do quite well. And these are options for expression and communication. This is allowing tools like spell check, grammar check, calculators, graphic organizers, um, sentence starters and templates, diving deeper options. And I purposely skipped over practice tests and model examples because this is where I feel like um, this UDL checkpoint uh, guideline really gets us to think deeply about providing model examples. And when we're thinking of higher education, a lot of times um, our syllabi have it, so we have you know, a midterm and a final exam, and they're each worth like 25% of our grade. They're very high, um, you know, high that's high stress. <laughs> um, and there are often are opportunities to practice. So if the goal is really to get individuals to learn the content, why wouldn't we give practice test example and model examples of what we're looking for in our final projects in the final you know final summative essays that we may have let's really make sure that we're maximizing um, the scaffolds that are allowing uh, learners to get there and I say scaffolds very deliberate deliberately because scaffolds are just like the scaffolds on the outside of a building they're intended to help you out when you need it but then they're intended to be taken away so it's not that we always want, you know, ideally you start to really learn to spell. You start to really learn when to use the correct grammar. But they, like Grammarly is a really helpful tool that I'll often just use, you know, plug in really quickly some little piece of writing that I have and get a quick grammar check. And it's, you know, again, really helpful. Um, graphic organizers is probably, you know, just, again, really thinking of these as scaffolds that are meant to be taken away once we're thinking again about cognitive load. Once the cognitive load and the practice is there, that they're able to start to remove those scaffolds. So do you wanna to add to that? Yeah, I think um, really predicting those barriers um, to what the assignment is can really help you decide what those scaffolds and supports are. The, the third checkpoint there um, that's highlighted in the box, uh, this one is uh, my current love affair with <laughs> the guidelines, is I'm thinking constantly when, I, when um, we're presenting and when we're out working with teachers, how are we building fluencies with graduated levels of support for practice and performance? What can I put in, in the environment that students can select from, tools they can choose from, activities they can opt in or opt out of to build their fluency before I need to get to them, before I need to divert my attention from facilitating the whole group to work with small groups. A lot of times at the first sign of struggle, um, where I, I as a teacher was often running over to help that group. And I said, what can I, and I changed that to, what could be in the environment so that they can go to the tool to empower themselves? Because often if they needed help, a lot of times students weren't asking for help. They won't admit that they're not getting it. But if, when the tool was in the environment and when there was a scaffold or support, they would access those independently and obviously um, build their fluency in the work. So I'm kind of, I think I have a slide later on coming that you can look at, you know, an ELA lesson or a math lesson. But what are all of those tools that would be in the environment already um, that, that students could access to be able to, to meet, meet with success? So what kind of scaffolds and supports are you offering? What, what are in your environment already? Um, that students can access before they come to you uh, for success. Please share some ideas. And as you're sharing, I'll just point out the niggly distinction because uh, there was a researcher at CAST who used to really clarify the difference between scaffolds and supports. 
So again, those scaffolds are meant to be removed. Um, you know, it's like a cane when you have a broken leg, it's intended to be removed over time. A support is something you need, like glasses. Uh, you, know, you, you expect to keep those supports in the learning environment. Some individuals need different supports um, to be there throughout their learning experience, like glasses is a perfect example. Um, they're not intended to be removed the way um, scaffolds are. I love the sample notes idea. Um, and actually, that's another thing that David used to do in his UDL course, is he would have um, different learners each time sign up to be note takers. And they would just, there was no pressure on how they took notes, they just took their notes, and then they would share them to everyone at the end of the class period. And it was so interesting to hear what different people were taking from the different um, lectures that he was giving in class. So that can be really fun. Skeleton notes can be a really great starting point, especially for um, individuals who maybe have dysgraphia, they don't write really quickly, or they're slower to process verbal information. Sometimes it's a working load, uh, working memory um, challenge to just hold what the professor is saying in mind in time to be able to get it out. So if you have skeleton notes, that can really scaffold the variability in that. getting quiet so hopefully we've hit on some ideas for you and if you have ideas that you want to share with folks about um, options for expression and communication that can help to remove barriers can be designed in the environment to help get to that rigorous challenging learning okay. Just one other add-on, Allison. Use mul um, one of the guidelines. Use multiple tools for construction and composition. Um, this is where the maker education. <laughs> this yeah. checkpoint aligns really well with maker education that we're actually using uh, tools to construct things and, mm -hmm. and um, having totally different ways to um, express that knowledge. Um, we're seeing that grow in the K through 12 world. And I know um, we have a center out at Stanford um, that's looking at UDL design in kind of that maker way. Um, so really interesting uh, work there. But how are we offering those different ways, whether it's um, I want to express with a PowerPoint, I want to express with um, a Vocaroo, which is uh, the digital voice recorder. How, what are those different tools that we can use to construct and demonstrate our knowledge? And speech to text is a great one. That's one that I actually find when I go to give presentations or even start to write a, a brief article that I say it better than I write it. And so I appreciate being able to say it and then let the tool go ahead and, and type it out for me. It can be really helpful. Yeah, for all learners, speech recognition. Those are great examples. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. And ultimately, of course, this is you know, the highest level of the UDL guidelines where we're really going for that executive function and helping learners to be more independent and strategic in how um, they're demonstrating executive function skills. This is where I think our rubrics, our checklists can be extremely helpful. Taking um, long-term uh, semester projects and breaking them into weekly chunks. So I put a little reminder here for me. Um, there's a UDL cadre member, Liz Hartman, and she teaches a wonderful class, and I got to teach it one year for her. Um, and one of the things that I found she did so masterfully was take that long-term project that she had going through the entire semester and weekly making sure that it was slowly building to that final project and it was it literally was the kind of thing the students when they got to the end they said I can't believe how easy it was to do this incredibly big deep research paper because it was so broken up deliberately you know, it took her a lot of time to plan that in from the beginning but once it was there it was unbelievably um, set up for them to really be able to along the way build to a very rigorous um, outcome at the end it was it was powerful for me as an educator to watch and it was so well designed that someone else was actually able to teach it I was able to go and teach that course it was remarkably effortless <laughs> to be able to go and teach your course so once you do this design, this proactive design to remove barriers, your job will be easier. I really, um, I'm going to hold strong to that statement because um, I've experienced it. Um, and, uh, and your learners, I think, will get to higher outcomes with those scaffolds and supports in there. 
So other, yeah, other ideas that you may have. I know for me um, in my science lab, this is where I started with UDL. Uh, I found that for me, one of the biggest barriers when I was teaching, one of the places I was most tired was during my science labs. They often felt a little chaotic to me. I really didn't think students understood um, the content very well. I didn't think that they really were making the transfer between what we were learning academically and what we were doing in labs. I think they thought the labs were fun, but I didn't think the learning was really strong. And I felt like I was constantly having to um, give ideas and, and support their learning in terms of what they needed to do next. So they weren't understanding the process in order to be able to know well enough um, you know, what to do next and why that made sense. So I started with my UDL world, um, thinking about my labs and one of those most simple things I did was I just started adding checklists and I took all I figured one of the biggest barriers were all it was just literally all the language in those labs they had they were so they were so language dependent so reading dependent and when you're in the move in the move um, in the moment of a lab it's really hard to sit and read so making smaller condensed checklists that had little visual images, it was amazing the difference that I saw in the design of the labs, in the way that the students were able to access the information and demonstrate mastery of the lab content. It was really exciting. So for you uh, lab science educators out there, any projects can be, you know, I really think project-based learning, um, there are a lot of wonderful things about project-based learning, but there are also a lot of barriers to it. And so really thinking about how we can use these options for executive function to scaffold that process can be helpful. Some thoughts or questions? And now I'm thinking back to the barriers that we mentioned before, and all of these are things that can help to change those mindsets, to develop that growth mindset around, I can, one thing at a time, um, you know, one assignment, one piece, um, proving to themselves that they can overcome an obstacle uh, in, in a way using a tool or a strategy that's been recommended. Um, that's the way that we change those mindsets. Um, so hopefully, you know, these, these are the little things that are going to get over those large barriers. Other thoughts, questions, strategy ideas? Hey. All right, seeing no action. Tell us a little bit about, <laughs> was that your organic, organic chemistry test? Yeah, when I, you know, when I think of action and expression, I go back to organic chemistry um, because I really just want to challenge you all to think about where do you want the rigor for your learners? So here's what I had to do to do well in organic chemistry. Um, because I failed the first test and I studied like crazy. I went to every lecture. Um, you know, it's kind of like that model student. I took all the notes, I did all the readings, I worked so hard to try to get the examples and I failed the first test. And it was unbelievably disheartening to me. And, you know, I think actually the ultimate goal for that professor was to weed people out and to, um, you know, basically use that as a way to decrease enrollment in the sciences for whatever reason. So if the goal is to weed learners out, then yeah, having kind of a rigorous test that doesn't really align with the work you're doing in class or the problems that you're doing, um, that's, a, that's a way to do that. If your goal is about learning, however, <laughs> um, oh, I'd love to go back and have a conversation with this organic chemistry teacher, uh, but if the goal is around the learning, I really challenge you to think deeply about the options that you make available for your learners to practice and to really be able to learn. Because the strategy that I had to take to pass that class, and actually I did remarkably well in the class, but I don't have any memory of it, but what I had to do was I had to find someone, a past student, who had access to old tests and the old tests were um, not like the problem sets that we were doing um, in the chapters but they you know the teacher who knew organic chemistry deeply had taken that and made deeper thinking problems which we never had an opportunity to practice but then they showed up on the test 
So I had to purchase with my own money. Remember, it was $150 for me to purchase a bunch of old tests. And I had to memorize the different steps that a student had filled out on there. None of this was from the instructor themselves. And sit by, I sat by myself in a library memorizing these. So then when I got to a test, the actual test, I thought, okay, which problem is this like, you know, that I memorized? And I regurgitated and I did well in that class. And it just makes me so frustrated because that wasn't learning. I was strategic, but it wasn't strategic towards rigorous learning of the content. It was about how to get through achieving the goal that I needed on my transcript. Um, so I really, especially by the time we get to hire, we had a, we had a K-12, a high school teacher the other day say, um, don't we need to teach students to sit during lectures because that's what they'll have to do in college. And I thought, wow, if a goal is to sit through a lecture, that's one thing. And that is a good skill to learn but that shouldn't drive our instruction. If we are going for deep learning, we need to recognize that there are multiple ways that we can access and that we can allow students to be able to, um, to build their understanding, to gain depth of understanding, to achieve rigorous content goals, not to go around the system finding different ways. We'll find ways to act you know, for action and expression, um, but is it in service of rigorous learning? Um, so I see this is maybe, read, let's see, Gail's comment. You have an instructor who's engaging students in the book by reading orally. He breaks the narration by talking to the text, writing notes, asking questions within the book. And they typically read one chapter per class period, so about 10 to 15 minutes. So they have hard copies to follow along. They can choose and write chapter summaries. Yeah, it sounds like, again, they're going after engagement and they're going through not just reading it, but reading and talking through multiple means of action and expression. That sounds very interactive. That sounds like what experts do. And so again, we're thinking about what do expert writers do? Ex expert uh, readers do? What do expert chemistry do? How do they approach, what's the strat what are the strategies they use to approach those problems? I wanna know those. That's, what, that's rigorous learning to me. That would have been much more engaging than trying to memorize old tests that I had to pay for. Um, yeah, thank you for sharing that. That's a great, a great example. So are there other examples that are resonating or um, are there ways that you think about how to get, for the, get to the rigor that you're after through allowing students to demonstrate um, understanding in multiple ways through uh, executive function, through expression and communication, through physical action? Because often UDL is misunderstood for just being about options for physical action, and it's so much more. This getting to this executive function and really thinking deeply about the tools for expression and communication. Um, uh, you know, the model examples we're, get, we're giving, the sentence stems, the, the graphic organizers, um, concept maps of your entire course, so you're able to zoom in for a certain lesson and zoom out and see how it's all related to each other. That really allows for deep level of learning and transfer. All right, well, if you think of anything, let us know. <laughs> what this is making me think, Allison, is that um, we know it when we see it, that when we're, in, when we're in classrooms, when we're in environments where all this is supported, we know it when we see it. And the language of the guidelines can help um, in our context to really unify people. Um, I look at um, UDL as such a powerful tool for us as educators to own our own situations, to look at our own problems and be able to apply the guidelines in ways that can help us to support and not feel um, you know, inundated with the problems or not feel overcome by the problems. But we can really look deep into those guidelines and say, how can we support the learner? How can we create the environment so that all students can um, and all learners can be successful? And that's where we go back to our intentional design. <laughs> yeah, so again, just remember, this, this is a, a visual representation of how we hope you really bring this UDL framework to life that there's a significant planning component where you think deeply about your goals, which you know, we started to scaffold in that, um, 
in the Excel sheet. You're thinking um, about variability and you're thinking about the variability in terms of, oh, I should have had all of the guidelines up there now. Yeah. Representation, action and expression, and engagement. We have all three of them now, which is really exciting. So where can you get the most bang for your buck? Which UDL guideline will really allow you to remove the barriers that are blocking, you know, kind of the low hanging fruit? Go for that first. Uh, is there access to the information? Is it about executive function? Go after that in your UDL plus one, then try it out. See what happens. See what kind of assessments you get. See what um, kind of student evidence of student learning you get, the artifacts that you get. Um, and then of course, reflect and share out what worked well, what barriers are still there. What measures do you have of change that may have been different than what you had before? So good, thank you, Marilyn. Here are some ideas of alternate assessments, such as verbal presentations, creating products, um, doing service projects. That's wonderful because it's connecting to your community. It's making it very relevant, the different work. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. So remember, goal-driven, we're supporting variability. We're putting the burden of change on the design of the environment, not within the learner themselves. So are there questions with, so now, yeah, now you've been filling out this form with your opportunities, these needs for change. Um, Neil and I have filled out some examples of our plus ones that we would do with our problems of practice, aligning them to the action and expression guidelines. So what we wanna invite you and challenge you to do, again, you know, before the next time we meet, is to try a UDL plus one in the action and expression um, um, guideline. And so if you want to return to the original goal that you were thinking about, your original opportunity, and keep building, now you have um, a, you know, a few strategies, one from engagement, one from representation, one from action and expression, um, that you'll be looking to see uh, you know, what measures, what changes, what student outcomes did you have, learner outcomes, it may not be just necessarily students. So anything, yeah, any questions with that process that, again, we're trying to scaffold that executive function by breaking down this whole process that we've had over, you know, the last few months. And we tried each week, each session to just build a little bit more. And hopefully now you're starting to see how it all comes together, how it is all very goal driven towards your disciplinary expertise. Um, thinking about removing those barriers using the UDL guidelines, um, but then being very reflective and intentional about how you design in the future. Questions, other thoughts? Hopefully the conversation today has sparked an area. Please feel free at any point um, between now and the next webinar to jump into those uh, into that Google Doc and really um, dive deep into that, considering the language. And when we when we come to this this common language of UDL uh, within our context, it really empowers us as teachers to have and as educators in, in all of our contexts to really have a language that speaks to the complexity of all that we're trying to do in this in this work that is education. Um, we're we're naming it. We're saying how difficult it is to help students overcome their barriers, but we're also empowered because we have this common language and we can then um, think of those solutions. Excellent. So just a couple things. We're remembering that there's a large group that was working on their orientation process. So how does this, um, this information kind of go back to what, what we were talking about last about in the intake process, we were thinking about so many different ways to represent the information. Now, how do how can students act on that in multiple ways. Uh, what barriers can we reduce for them um, signing up or accessing the services that are there. Um, are there digital ways? Are there um, options for um, supporting their executive functioning throughout the process? How can we really bust open this process and say, how are we supporting um, our learners and getting signed up and registered for the, for the services available? So please continue to consider that. The next few slides, um, you'll recognize similar slides from our previous webinars are just more and more resources that you can dive in. These have all also been linked in that um, accessible document that we shared earlier. So feel, you do not have to get back into these slides to get those, they're all there. Um, here's an example of those building fluencies that we talked about. Um, so in an ELA classroom, um, is there a graphic organizer, a word bank, sentence frames, exemplar models and prompts before, that I, before I consider pulling into the small groups? Um, so just consider, you know, what can be put in the environment to really support and scaffold the learning. So 
that'll bring us to our next trajectory. March 16th, we are going to really um, go based upon your feedback if people have some video conferencing that we wanna do, um, emails that we get, letting us know what we need, but we really look at that as like a workshop time um, where we'll provide some probing questions into helping you prepare um, your UDL stories um, and preparation for that March 25th day. We'll really dive into that spreadsheet again that we've been filling out and really thinking about your problems of practice, your specific goals, um, and your UDL plus ones that you've been integrating. Yeah, so remember in preparation for that March 25th day, three to five minute presentation that'll be shared probably twice. Um, what do you, you, does UDL mean for your program or your operations? What are the impl implications for instruction? And please bring some artifacts. If you, even if it's one thing um, that you can bring that people can see, we have, we're gonna try to group by um, like situations or like roles so that you can really benefit from each other's work in this process. So we're really looking forward to that time. And note that the presentation doesn't have a format. So if you have some way that you prefer sharing out with folks, we are open for that. So in, you know, in the, um, in the spirit of options for action and expression, um, you know, certainly you could do a PowerPoint, you could do a vocaroo, you could just share something verbally, you could have, um, you know, some, your, again, your artifact with just some post-it notes. Um, you could have a little videotape of a moment in your context where, you know, you were trying something. So, um, so really sky's the limit. If you need more sky, well, you know, we'll, we'll go through March 16 and break it out more. Um, so that if, if that, if that choice is overwhelming, that you have a way to, um, really be purposeful in the selection of your, of your choice. Excellent. So thank you. Uh, March 16th will be Q and A. So come ready with your questions. If it's something that you think we might need to prepare for um, in advance, please email us um, your questions so that we can kind of prepare something and have those uh, ready to go. We'll have some sample stories, some examples of what we're, we're, what we're hoping that people will bring back and share. And um, we'll also give you some prompts so that you can uh, be considering what, what are the kinds of things I might wanna answer? What are the kind of things that I might wanna be telling um, other participants about the experience? So that's the design for our day. Excellent. Any questions or last minute thoughts for this Friday conversation? <laughs> We really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much for joining us. And we're really looking forward to, um, to starting to share out your stories more and more. Have a great afternoon. Wonderful, thank you. All the best.